Hey to everyone at the 180, at the well, and at Coburg Alliance. This moment is kind of bittersweet because this is the last message in our series, Why Church. I'm excited that we've gotten this far. I'm so glad that we've been able to journey together as three different churches over the last five weeks. And my hope is that today is both enjoyable and challenging for you as you think about what it means to be the church. Check this out. This is the model version of a 1964 Mustang convertible. The real thing, the life-sized version of this is a beautiful thing. But if you come across the real thing, you know it was manufactured 60 years ago, and that means it usually requires a lot of upkeep, depending on what condition the owner first bought it in. And if you know someone who's a car guy or a car gal who likes restoring older vehicles, you know they're pretty devoted to their craft. They could spend hours and hours, days probably, and a lot of money getting the real version of a car like this fixed up so it's road ready. And the point, of course, is that it's road ready. You don't usually wanna spend all that time and money and effort on something this beautiful just so it sits in the garage. You wanna drive the car eventually. You don't want it just sitting in your garage forever. What a waste, right? Cars were meant to be driven. The whole point is that the car can be used according to its potential, according to how it was made. They're meant to be in motion. And actually, if you don't drive the car often enough, certain things start to happen. Batteries lose their charge, tires lose air pressure, oils, other fluids, even the fuel can deteriorate or go bad. Cars were meant to move. And so is the church. The church was meant to be in motion. If you've been with us up to this point in the series, you'll know we've been exploring what the church is because to understand the question why church, we have to also understand what the church is. We have to understand what it means to be the church, to be this group of people who are loved by God, saved from our sin because of Christ, and learning what it means to live Christ-centered lives alongside other people who are learning to live that same kind of life. And so we've discovered that the church is a mystery in some ways. It's a family that God shapes people's identities through the church, that the church is marked by baptism and communion, and in a healthy church, truth is meant to be sifted from error. And all that together helps us understand the identity of the church. It helps us understand what it means to be the church. But if churches stop there, if they're all those things and nothing more, then they run the risk of becoming something God never intended. They run the risk of becoming holy huddles. They can become a group of navel gazers. They only look at themselves instead of also looking outward. And if a church does that for too long, it eventually becomes really comfortable in all the wrong ways. The moment a church stops looking outward and only looks inward, the moment it's no longer moving towards something other than itself is the moment it starts to risk becoming irrelevant, meaningless, and unhelpful for anyone outside the church. And the church starts to become separated from its God-given identity as a group of people who are meant to help connect people to the life-giving love of God in Christ. Jesus' last command to his closest followers in the Gospel of Matthew puts them in motion. Check this out. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The disciples were meant to be in motion. They're not meant to sit around in a room forever waiting for people to come to them. People might come to them, and it'd be great if they did, but that's not the instruction Jesus gave. The disciples were meant to go, to actively work toward helping people of all nations connect with God. These people would get baptized and receive ongoing spiritual development through the teaching of Jesus. And in the book of Acts, they're given more instruction on what it means to be the church, and it includes being in motion. 
Jesus tells them this in Acts 1, 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And if you walk through the book of Acts from beginning to end, you see this movement, this expansion from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria to what the disciples would understand as the ends of the earth. And the implication was that anyone reading along in the book of Acts and aligning as a follower of Jesus would continue that mission of witnessing to the life-giving love of God in Christ. And that mission that Jesus gave his closest followers 2,000 years ago is the same mission for the church today. To be the church, you have to be in motion. A church isn't meant to only focus on itself, but to move toward people who aren't yet connected to the life-giving love of God in Christ. And just like that 64 Mustang convertible, if the church doesn't move, if it sits around for too long, it'll slowly deteriorate. It'll become useless. In fact, churches that aren't in motion eventually die out. They might not die out completely, but they become unrecognizable as, the ch as a church the way God meant churches to be. Imagine the result if the disciples heard Jesus' instruction in Matthew and in Acts and decided to just spend all their time sitting around. The idea wasn't that they'd receive power from God so they could use God's gift to focus only on themselves. The idea was for them to also be outwardly focused, to be in motion, to be witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And that's what they did. God moved, they responded, people came to faith, and the church flourished. Check this out. Acts 2.47, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Acts 4.4, 4. but many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Acts 5.14, nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Acts 6.7, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Acts 9.31, then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. And finally, Acts 11.21, the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. This is the church in motion in the book of Acts, and it just kept going. God fueled their lives and ministries. People faithfully responded and the church grew. And though it wasn't easy because they faced a ton of opposition and persecution, they remained in motion, sharing the life-giving love of God in Christ with everyone. And people believed. So what does it mean to be the church? Part of what it means is being people who move toward anyone who needs to experience the life-giving love of God in Jesus Christ. And that motion applies to those both within and outside the church. You can see that in Acts. Check this out from Acts chapter two. Here's what the church is doing. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over all of them, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Acts 2 gives a vision of the early church in motion. It's a church that's centered on teaching, togetherness, sharing meals, prayer, even selling what they had to provide for others in need. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The early church in motion was one that was focused on sharing the life-giving love of God in a bunch of different ways. And here's what I see in what we just read. If the early church had something that was life-giving, they shared it. 
whether financial resources or the power of God to perform miracles or the ability to share the good news of Jesus Christ and his teaching, if it was life-giving, they shared it with each other and with those outside of the church and the church flourished. If what they had was life-giving, they shared it. And I think that vision is the same vision for us today. If what we have is life-giving, we're meant to share it. But I don't think we're meant to share it too aggressively or forcefully. The church has a history at times of taking what's supposed to be life-giving and doing damage instead. Think again about that 64 Mustang convertible. If you push that gas pedal down as hard as you can for too long, you'll eventually start to damage the car. And you may put other people around you at risk. It's harder to control the vehicle. If you're too aggressive or forceful when driving the car, you can do damage. So even though there are different ways of driving that Mustang that won't cause any damage, there are some ways that will definitely cause damage. And as a church in motion, it's the same. We're meant to share with others the life-giving love of God that can be shared in a bunch of different ways, like we saw in Acts, without being so aggressive or forceful that we cause damage. Okay, so, so if that makes sense to you, then maybe you want to be a church in motion or you're already a church in motion, but you're curious about how to become a church that stays in motion. If that's the case, what do you do? I think there's a question that may help guide you toward whatever it is God has for you personally and for your church. Are you ready? How can you change so you can reach a changing world? Now, anytime someone starts talking about change, people get nervous, like they start sweating a little bit. Do you mean what we believe about the Bible is going to change? Do you mean changing those core truths that have been around for thousands of years? Is that what you mean? I'm not suggesting we try to change the things that are fundamental to faith. We're not trying to rewrite or twist the Bible so it means something different. I'm suggesting that we explore the areas where we can and even need to change to meet a changing world. In some general ways, our world today is the same as the first century biblical world. That's true. People still have physical, social, mental, and spiritual needs. And the life-giving love of God in Christ can be expressed in many different ways to meet those needs. But in in many ways, our world has changed. And it continues to change more rapidly than ever before. So this question, I think, is more vital now than it's ever been. How can you change so you can reach a changing world. The kind of change that I'm suggesting here actually has biblical precedent, like in the book of Acts. Let's look there again. Acts is filled with God doing new things. It's the story of the birth of the church, and a birth is always a moment where a new thing has now arrived, like the story of the Gentiles in the New Testament. A Gentile is a term used by Jews to describe anyone who isn't Jewish. And because the Jewish people were the ones that God chose in the Old Testament to reveal who he was to the world, there was this sense that anyone who came to believe in God as a Gentile then had to follow Jewish law, even as Christians. But people soon discovered that that wasn't true. God was doing a new thing. After Christ, Gentiles were welcomed into God's family and they didn't have to follow the whole Jewish law to be part of that family. And after Christ, God no longer met with his people in this structure called a temple. He now lived in his people in the church. God was doing a new thing. We get tempted at times to resist God's desire to do a new thing in and through us or in and through our church because the past is really comfortable. We're used to it. We're used to the way things have been. Some some church people, they remember when they used to have this or that program, and it was the best. Or our church used to be known for this thing, or our church used to have 100 kids in youth, or our church used to, you can fill in the blank. And when we look back on those moments, we might be rightly remembering a time when our church was thriving. And I bet that time really was good. And if you look back on those times and they fuel your faith in God in the present, that's a win. But if they cause you to simply lament that today isn't like yesterday, the memory isn't helpful. 
And it may cause you to resist the change that God's wanting you to step into. And everyone, even every church, runs the risk of getting stuck in that rut. Whether your church has been around for 8, 18, or 80 years, you can get stuck in a rut that prevents you from changing in ways that are healthy and good. If you want to be a church in motion, if you want to be actively sharing the life-giving love of God in Christ in ways that are well-received, in ways that are effective in a changing world, I think you have to be aware of the tendency, of the temptation even, to idolize the past. And if you're not even aware of the tendency as a church or as a person, you can run the risk of becoming an ancient relic, especially for churches. A nice memory of what used to be. You can remember and learn from the past, but you can't live in it. In Isaiah 43, God's trying to help his people understand this idea. Here's what God says in Isaiah 43, 18 to 19. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. God's people were so fixated on the past that they couldn't see the new thing God was trying to do in and for them. He was making a way in the wilderness where there was no way. He was creating streams in the wasteland and they couldn't see it. Is God wanting to do a new thing in you and in your church? Especially when it comes to sharing the life-giving love of God in Christ with the people around you, both the people who are in your church and in the world around you. And if he's wanting to do something new, where do you need to change to align with that new thing? I wanna suggest one way that you could start to explore that question, and it's by asking if you have any sacred cows. Have you heard that idiom before? A sacred cow. Cow is something that's unreasonably immune to criticism or opposition. And over time, nobody nobody can actually answer the question, why is that sacred cow still around? Here's what this might sound like. Someone asks, why do we do it that way? And the answer is usually something like, we just always have. Nobody really knows why. Or when they do sort of know why, it's no longer that convincing or it's become so embedded in the identity of the church that to question it is to commit what seems kind of like a mortal sin and nobody wants to rock the boat, so nobody touches it. Sacred cows can be anything, a way of doing things, an idea even. It could be that cross or that piano that's always been in the same place up front on the platform for 40 years and any suggestion about adjusting it is met with aggressive hostility or even subtle dissatisfaction. If it's unreasonably immune to criticism or opposition, it's a sacred cow. And sacred cows tend to prevent healthy change. And for churches, that can actually be damaging because that sacred cow may be the very thing that prevents you from making a healthy change that enables you to share the life-giving love of God in Christ with those who need it. So before I share an example with you of a sacred cow that I think affects the church today, I wanna give you a second to identify some yourself. You can take a minute and talk about those things with the person next to you if you'd like. You could write a few down or you can just take a quick nap. Can you identify any sacred cows in your personal life, in the church, or in the world around you? Take a minute.
Okay, now that you've got a list of like a hundred sacred cows, here's the cow that came to mind for me. Are you ready? The church should never talk about politics. Now, if you panicked inside and you started sweating profusely, like maybe you did a moment ago, you're super concerned about what I'm about to say. This might actually be a sacred cow for you. Here's the thing. I'm not suggesting the church should try to convince people to vote for one party over another, but almost everyone in every church is politically active. If you vote, you're politically active. If you pay taxes, your money is funding political realities. For a long time, people have thought that because they valued the separation of church and state, and many people do, that that meant the church could or should never talk about politics. But that eventually produces people who are less capable of applying a well-developed, thoughtful Christian worldview to political activity. Remember COVID? Maybe, maybe not. I think part of the reason COVID created so much tension for some people in the church is that we hadn't spent much time before that thinking about how a Christian worldview might apply to different political realities. How do we navigate that together? We weren't very well prepared because of a sacred cow just hanging around. Many churches found themselves wrestling with how to have healthy conversations around what was suddenly a very active reality. So if you've identified a sacred cow, what do you do to move forward? How do you take that next step? I'm guessing that every cow is a little bit different, but in this case, our church invited a theology professor who's published in the area of political theology to come speak about that topic on a Sunday morning, followed by a Q&A afterward, and that was a way of re-engaging the conversation around the intersection of faith and politics, which can help in the process of tipping over that sacred cow to make room for the new things that God might be wanting to do in our church. And tipping those cows is crucial because over time, they can cause division among people in your church and they can ruin a church's ability to lean into the new things God might be trying to do. But I think there's one more step. Because it's one thing to identify the cows that currently exist and maybe even tip some of those over. It's another to be aware of the cows that you might be creating, even now. Jeannie Daniel Duck has studied the factors that can fuel or foil corporate transformation and change. And I think what she says applies to the church. Here's what she says. Don't make today's innovations into tomorrow's sacred cows. New churches or new expressions of the church, even maybe some changes that we make in our churches now, they can sometimes be built on a desire to just be different from the old way of doing things. And even if the new expression is good and healthy and effective, if it doesn't remain humble and open and aware, if the church doesn't anyway, remain humble and open and aware, it runs the risk of becoming what the next generation thinks is the old way of doing things. Don't make today's innovations into tomorrow's sacred cows. The more you as a church can be aware of the moments you might be creating sacred cows, the better. Because cows are hard to move, especially when everyone thinks they're sacred. And one of the ways you can stay aware of that tendency to make today's innovations into tomorrow's sacred cows is by regularly asking the question, how do we as a church need to change so we can reach a changing world? To really be the church means being a church in motion, moving toward those who need to experience the life-giving love of God in Christ expressed in probably a hundred different ways. And my hope is that the questions we've teased out today after exploring God's activity in the life of the early church can either help you become a church in motion or help you remain in motion. So what do you need to change to meet the needs of a changing world?